please welcome former executive director of the American Library Association, Tracy D. Hall, and the mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas, USA, Frank Scott Jr., in conversation with host of 1A for NPR, Jen White. I'm so excited to be in conversation with the two of you today as we look at this intersection of a push for book banning, how it connects to extremism, and what it means for the leaders of cities. Now, Tracy, you recently resigned from your position as president of the American Library Association, but briefly just paint a picture for us. What are public libraries and school libraries facing right now when it comes to this push to censor information? Yes, thank you so much. Well, the majority of book bans are happening right now at the school library level, about 60%. And the other 40% or almost 40% are happening at the level of public libraries. And that differential in percentage means that there are book bans and attempts to uh, restrict or censor books actually happening at independent bookstores as well. And what we're seeing is that we are seeing a rise in censorship that is so extreme as to outshadow the McCarthy era, in which about 30,000 books were either banned or burned. And this is happening, it seems as if it's happening, happening in isolated events all across the country. But when we read them in total, we are experiencing a rise in banning of books that we've never seen in this country before. Mayor Scott, Little Rock, Arkansas has such a deep and rich history connected to the struggle for civil rights. How do you view your role as mayor when it comes to the question of how we make information available for the public, how do we protect the full American story, the good, the bad, and the ugly? I think one must understand um, that, particularly as it relates to Little Rock, that Little Rock history is Arkansas history, it's American history, it's not black history. Uh, we know that, uh, but in a day and age where right now in the state's capital city, um, history education is under attack. And you have the Little Rock Nine who truly were the testimony, the trial, and the triumph of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, to have a legislature that's trying to repeal, revise, in some ways even reimagine that history uh, is kind of daunting. And so it's my role as mayor is to speak up and speak out uh, for the voices of the voiceless. Uh, and to truly have liberation, one must understand its own history. Tracy, when we talk about book banning, we can talk about it as, as an isolated issue. But when we zoom out and think more about extremism in the US writ large, how do those issues connect? Yeah. Well, two things come to mind right away. Um, I think a lot about Representative John Lewis, uh, late Representative John Lewis, who said before he died so presciently that he believed that access to the internet, meaning access to information more broadly, would be the civil rights issue of the 21st century. And so I do think that we have to connect the censorship of books to other attempts to challenge our foundational rights, our constitutional rights, right? So yesterday I was testifying at a congressional briefing about the connection between free speech, the freedom to read, and freedom of religion, because both, you know, and freedom of the press, right, are all equally protected. And yet, um, you remember when just misinformation, we, that's all we had to battle? Those were the good old days, right? We are now, um, we're starting with disinformation. We have information segregation, and of course, I think the pernicious, most pernicious form is information withdrawal, which is what censorship is. And I think the fact that we're starting to see more state-sanctioned 
uh, censorship, it should be alarming to everyone. But there are some bright points. You know, we have um, some cities like the city of Chicago. Um, we have uh, cities like Toronto um, that are creating book sanctuaries. We have cities like Brooklyn. We have cities um, like Seattle that are also making sure that access to books that are banned, um, that access in those libraries can be found regardless of where people are. But I do think we have to connect um, the erosion of uh, access to books. We have to fight against that, but we have to connect it um, to other encumbrances. Mm -hmm. Mayor Scott, you signed on to the U.S. Conference of Mayors Combat to Combat combat hate and extremism. That was back in 2017. And then you renewed that commitment again this year. What shape does that commitment take in Little Rock, both in terms of the actions you're taking around extremism and potential violence, but also around protecting and telling the full story of American history? Well, I think we, we have to all understand, we as mayors uh, take an oath to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of our residents. Uh, in that same vein, uh, there are many times there are extremists that are around that are utilizing uh, black history, they're utilizing uh, different things that they may have a disagreement with, however, it is history, and they utilize that as a flashpoint to create others to galvanize, to create hate. Uh, and so we as mayors have to fight against hate. We have to combat against it, uh, no matter uh, what the race, what the gender, what the sexual orientation or the ethnicity or culture, uh, to ensure that we maintain peace and order, but also to maintain an understanding. Uh, many may not know, but I'm an associate pastor. Uh, but as an associate pastor, I'm still a mayor and so during Ramadan, I'm worshiping with my Muslim residents. Uh, during uh, Jewish tradition, I'm, I'm focusing on that. When it's the Holy Week with Hindu, I'm there as well. Uh, we have to be the true ambassador of our respective cities and show peace and love at the same time. Are there policy initiatives you're able to enact to help support that work? Yes, so one of the first things we did when we were elected in 2018 uh, was to create an Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, through a chief equity officer. And so our chief equity officer is focusing on a lot of those policies. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, Tracy, because it's easy, again, to look at the issue of book banning as something that is, is contained. Right. It's only affecting libraries. It's only affecting school libraries. But when I think about the current environment of mis and disinformation, the way it proliferates so quickly, and I also think about the crisis around literacy, yes. both for children and adults. How do these issues connect to one another? That's a great question, because I do think that we are seeing um, similar trajectories, right? So, um, you know, we're at a time now where there are, um, across the country, uh, there's legislation that says that certain people can't have access to particular types of books, or that some books should be removed from libraries altogether or restricted. In the same communities, you also see rising adult low literacy. So when public libraries in particular were being built across this country, funded by Carnegie and, and Kellogg and Rosenwald, um, the reason why that was happening is because some of these, um, some of these chiefs of industry, these titans of industry, um, realized that they needed both an informed workforce so that they could have a more productive workforce, and they needed informed consumers so that they could have wealthier consumers, right? And so they began to build libraries, and they began to normalize adult literacy. Um, some of those cities at the uh, turn of the 19th century, we had two out of five adults who weren't able to read past the fifth grade level. Today, guess what? We have returned. Uh, and I think we have a perfect storm in which um, this chilling effect, the censorship, this chilling effect around reading, which is really amplifying two things, that we have adults in this country that we are restricting in terms of what they can read, and we also have adults and young adults in this, city, in this country that can't read. And so I do think that I like to think of them as two things that we have to counter. We have to fight for the right to read, and we have to make sure that everybody can exercise that right. Mayor Scott, when you think about Little Rock, for instance, what services do the libraries in your city provide? Not, not just around literacy, but when I think about the libraries I grew up in, we spent summers there, 
with our stack of books and we you know, take a step away from lunch, but now they've become, in many ways, the town halls of the modern community. Uh, quick shout out to Nate Coulter, who's the executive director of the Central Arkansas Library System, which is a combination of several counties, but really Little Rock is the, uh, the premier part of, of that area and most of the resources are focused there. Uh, he has found himself at the epicenter of dealing with uh, the book banning issues. Uh, and so you have a situation where literally his office is suing to ensure that he does not have to ban books. Uh, but then secondly, as you shared, uh, our library systems in Little Rock has really become not only the town hall, but really the community hub. It's a place where individuals are able to, if they need a job, to apply for jobs. It's a workforce center. Uh, it's a place of education. It's a place to grab a cup of coffee and go on a cheap date. <laughs> and so uh, it's, you guys have done it before. If you haven't been cheap before, I have. <laughs> but it brings everyone on one accord, and, and that's what education does. You get a chance to lose yourself in a book, uh, to go to a different country, uh, to experience a new thing, and you can do that right there in our library system. So, Tracy, what is this fight then around book banning mean for how libraries operate, whether they're able to operate at all? Yes, absolutely, because a lot of the legislation around um, book banning and censorship is being closely followed by legislation to defund or eliminate public libraries. And, and school libraries have already taken a huge hit across this country. In fact, the wealthier the school, the more likely they are to have a, a, a librarian in a well-staffed library. The, less wealthy, the less likely. And so I do think that the fight is about two things. And I want to shout out um, Houston Public Library and also what is now currently the only mayor's office for adult literacy. And if I can use this opportunity to say anything, I, I want to say that we need more offices of adult literacy across the country. That has to be, this is the call to action, I think. We have to arrest um, adult low literacy or else we will find ourselves susceptible to more extreme Right, And our cities can't afford that because we know that cities that are seen as being too extremist or behind the times um, or where there's authoritarianism creeping in are cities that cannot retain or attract talent. They're not places that people want to bring businesses. And so this is a fight for everyone. But I think the fight is to make sure first of all, that we understand that free people must read freely. And as executive director of the American Library Association, that was a clarion call. Today, for me, the other thing, though, is to make sure that more adults and young adults can read and to understand that libraries, as the mayor is saying, are at the epicenter of that fight. So Tracy's placed you at the epicenter of that fight. <laughs> so in your role as mayor, as you think about not, what, not just what's at stake, but what you can do as a mayor to combat extremism, protect your libraries, but you're, you also think about the limitations you face as a mayor. What are, what are the two sides of that coin? I don't think we have the opportunity to take a side when I say that from the standpoint of we respond to our residents. Uh, we respond to the greater good. And just like we've seen during the pandemic, mayors had to step up. Uh, they had to go against governors. Uh, we had to go against state legislatures to do the will of the people. And that's the same case right now as it relates to education uh, within any city at this point in time. I, I think back moving a little bit from libraries, but just to African American history as an AP course. Uh, that recently was challenged uh, in Little Rock. And here you have Elizabeth Eckford, who was a member of Little Rock Nine, who stood up at the age of 15 to integrate and test Brown versus Board of Education to equalize education across these United States. Sadly, she had to stand up at 81 to fight to make certain that the Little Rock School District defied the state and to still offer the AP class. That's the type of side that we take, the side of right. And when you're on the right side of right, nothing else matters. So Tracy, I know in this room we have not just mayors, but other city leaders. And at the end of the day, concerned citizens. Yes. So, 
what would you say to us about what we can do both in your, our roles as elected leaders or just as concerned citizens to protect libraries, protect the collective right to read, and protect our communities from extremism? Yeah, so I think one thing is to understand that um, municipal government is the most important seat of government right now in this country and to understand the roles that mayors and uh, city administration play in battling extremism and making sure that access to information remains a human right. And you can do that by inviting everyone in your city to read banned books or just everyone in your city to read together. We know that Pew uh, Trust has told us that most adults, if they graduate high school or college, never read a full book again. Let's counter that. Let's have a reading revolution. And let's let that happen. Let's make sure that that revolution happens at the level of the city. And we can start today. That's our time. Tracy Hall, Mayor Scott, thank you.